Alexander Mayrick Broadley. Alexander Mayrick Broadley, 19 July 1847 16 April 1916, also known as Broadley Pasha, was a British barrister, author, company promoter, and social figure. He is best known for being the defense lawyer for Ahmed Yurubai after the failure of the Yurubai Revolt. Early Life Broadley was the son of the Reverend Alexander Broadley, vicar of Bradpole, in Dorset, England, and Frances Jane, daughter of Thomas Mayrick of Pembroke. He entered Lincoln's in as a law student in 1866, and after taking the examination to enter the Indian Civil Service, went in 1869 to India, where he became assistant magistrate and collector of Patna, Bengal. In 1872, he conducted a survey of the ruins of the Nalanda monasteries at Burgayan, and formed a magnificent collection of sculptures from the region, going on to establish a museum for the collection. The colonial administrator and explorer Sir Harry H. Johnston noted that Broadley was very orthodox on account of his father, and was led into rude interruptions of any speech which traversed the belief that the earth was only six or seven thousand years old. In 1871, Broadley delivered a public lecture English legislation for India. He also put forward the view that imprisonment for civil debts should be abolished. In 1872, he spoke at a large meeting on education in Bengal, where he condemned the educational policy of the Indian government. He was not punished. But later that year, he spoke at a public meeting of the Dhaka People's Association. His remarks on educational policy and on the criminal procedure code, which were reported in newspapers and created angry discussions, were objected to by the Lieutenant Governor of Bengal, Sir George Campbell, and officially denied. Broadly applied for leave, which Campbell rejected, demanding an explanation. In May 1872, it was reported that charges of a serious nature had been brought against Broadley. He was suspended and sent to Patna pending an investigation. The following month he was reported to have been posted to Noinabad and ordered to remain there, having been invested with the power to try cases arising from riots of the Muslim Farazi sect. In November the Calcutta Gazette reported him as being officially on leave and transferred to Chittagong by Campbell's order. When a warrant for his arrest for homosexual offenses was issued, Broadley absconded. One report stated that his reputation was known to every Englishman who ever lived in India, and his presence was taboo in European clubs in Malta and Egypt. Due to the scandal, he was unable to return immediately to England. He moved to Tunis, where he worked as a lawyer and as a correspondent for the Times. One of his clients was the Bay of Tunis. He also became influential in Freemasonry, founding the prestigious Drury Lane Masonic Lodge, which is likely to have aided his social rise. In 1882, he published The Last Punic War, Tunis, Past and Present, which drew admiring reviews, Vanity Fair writing. If Mr. Broadley's book on Tunis were only read by all citizens who influenced the policy of ministers, I question very much whether anything like our Egyptian crime could be repeated. The dullest would see how far we have been led. Given Broadley's knowledge of Muslim law, and the fact he was abnormally clever, that same year Wilfred Blunt engaged him as counsel for Ahmed Yurbai, otherwise known as Aribai Pasha, an Egyptian nationalist who was put on trial in Cairo for insurrection. Broadley forced the compromise which enabled Pasha, and his companions to be sent as pensioners to Colombo. Broadley was paid 10,000 guineas, and was henceforth nicknamed Broadley Pasha by his friends, the press, and English society. Return to England Following the trial, Broadley returned to England as the agent and legal advisor of the ex Ismail. His social skills also saw him appointed de facto editor of Edmund Yates' Periodical World, and despite his previous disgrace, for a few years, he achieved an exceptionally high profile in London society. He knew everyone in London, and all paid court to him. Of his 40th birthday party in 1887, one newspaper recorded, princes and princesses, peers and peeresses, bishops and baronets, diplomatists and doctors, 
members of parliament and musicians, authors, and artists, actors and actresses availed themselves of the opportunity of offering birthday congratulations. An Indian official suggested that Broadley had not been compelled to return to India to answer the charges against him, as such a threat hanging over the head of the editor of an important society newspaper guaranteed that he would not publish anything of embarrassment. Of Falstaffian proportions, Broadley was described as that strange being, who, amongst other avocations, acts as a sort of social broker for bringing together people who would not otherwise meet. According to one report, he had the faculty of attaching himself to and running whomsoever was the most amusing and useful person of the hour. They included the nitrate king John Thomas North. It was at Broadley's Regent's Park home, Cairo Cottage at Two Beta Place, that Blanger made his London debut. Broadley also became connected with the management of the Theatre Royal, Drury Lane, acting as a financial and business adviser to Augustus Harris. Broadley's social ascendancy continued until 1889, when his portrait by Spy appeared in the magazine Vanity Fair. Edward Roman Seven, then Prince of Wales, whose son's portraits had also appeared in the magazine, and who had knowledge of Broadley's reputation in India, took offence at his inclusion. After making inquiries at Scotland Yard, the magazine's owner Edmund Yates dismissed Broadley and published an apology. Broadley was told to leave the country within twelve hours. The reason was not just the earlier scandal in India. Broadley was implicated as a client of the male brothel at the center of the Cleveland Street scandal. With the Prince of Wales' equerry involved, and rumors also connecting his eldest son, the prince was reported to be in a very stern and unbending mood. Said one newspaper report, everybody knows it was H.R.H., caused Broadley Pash's extinction. Le Figaro later alleged that Broadley had taken Bolanger and his propagandist Henry Rochefort to the brothel. The allegation was dismissed by Bolanger's right-hand man, Count Dillon. On the witness stand, the rent boy John Saul stated that he had briefly secured employment in the 1889 production, The Royal Oak at Drury Lane, which was during Broadley's time there. Exile Final return to England. In 1894, Broadley quietly returned to England to manage the estates and general affairs of Viscount Cantaloupe, who succeeded in 1896 as 8th Earl de Lawar. In April 1896, Broadley met the serial financial fraudster Ernest Terahooley and subsequently worked to promote his investment schemes. Newspaper reports alleged Broadley was a brilliant financier and Hooley was merely his ventriloquist's dummy. Later in court, Broadley freely admitted that he advised Hooley on nearly all his projects. Hooley purchased Anmer Hall Estate, adjoining Sandringham in 1896. Through an intermediary, the Prince of Wales requested that he be allowed to purchase the estate from Hooley, ostensibly for his daughter Maud, to which Hooley agreed. It has been alleged that the real reason for the Prince's action was to avoid the possibility of Broadley becoming a constant visitor to the estate and hence near neighbor. In 1898, Hooley was made bankrupt. In the bankruptcy court, Broadley appeared with Earl de Lawar and two other gentlemen. They were charged with contempt of court in attempting to bribe Hooley to alter his testimony to protect the Earl. Broadley was found guilty of insubordination and perjury and ordered to pay costs. Public opinion considered the treatment of Broadley by the judge very lenient. Broadley made a beautiful witness, one report suggested, brimming over with benevolence and pathos. He threatened to commit suicide, too, unless Hooley did something or other, and Hooley seems to have believed him. And him, and of him, him and him, believed him, and of him, and of him. Hooley stated on the witness stand that Broadley had intercepted money intended for others, and that he had made a further £80,000, acting as Hooley's promoter, accusations Broadley denied. With Broadley again the subject of publicity, in the House of Commons the Home Secretary was asked by a parliamentarian whether Broadley was the same person against whom there was an outstanding warrant for a criminal offence in India. 
Did such warrants apply in England, and if so, why had it not been actioned? The reply was that they did apply, but that he had no other information on the matter. Rodley was denounced by Robert Wright, Justice of the Court of the Queen's Bench, as the real author and organizer of Hooley's deceitful schemes, but escaped bankruptcy and fashioned himself as a country gentleman. He retreated to his home village of Bradpole, Dorset, building a picturesque towered mansion, the Knapp. Last years, last years, the last fifteen years of Broadley's life were devoted to writing and book collecting, Napoleon and his age being at the heart of it, but also a large collection of works on criminal jurisprudence. He made significant acquisitions of manuscript material, accumulating original letters and documents, as his book chats on autographs related. His library included 135 works he had grangerized by adding additional illustrations, amounting to about 600 volumes. He also became a prolific author of books on historical topics. In 1906, he even penned a work on the boyhood of his nemesis Edward Roman VII titled The Boyhood of a Great King. It drew at least one scathing review under the headline Scissors and Snobbery which stated, this stitching together of stale tattle from the royal nursery may be good business. It is not an undertaking which enlists our sympathy. Mr. Broadley's record as an ex-Indian civilian, ex-barrister, ex-journalist, and ex-company promoter is well known. This volume, in 1911, Broadley made a pilgrimage with friends over the route followed by Charles Roman II during his wanderings in late 1651 and wrote a history, The Royal Miracle, an interest sparked by the play The Royal Oak. Never married, Broadley died, in the middle of the First World War, on 16 April 1916 in Gerrard's Cross, Buckinghamshire. By the time of his death, Broadley's crimes had been largely forgotten, and his obituary in The Times and those elsewhere made no mention of them. This prompted novelist and U.S. newspaper columnist Marguerite Cunliffe Owen to restate them with the observation, of course, all this is old and forgotten, and, if I recall it, it is merely in order to show how very unreliable obituaries are apt to be, and the facility with which even such men as Broadley, if possessed of sufficient cleverness and of impudence, are able to legacy. In his will, Broadley left the sum of £8,506, the majority bequeathed to his nephew, Lieutenant R. A. L. Broadley, who put his collection up for sale. The Napolana was purchased and blocked by Lord Curzon, who bequeathed it to Oxford University. It now resides in the Bodleian with 332 of his Grangerized books. Other repositories of his Grangerized volumes include the theatre collection at Westminster City Archives, which holds four scrapbooks, Annals of the Haymarket, 1911, and the Royal Society, which owns a multivolume copy of Charles Richard Weld's History of the Royal Society. The contents of Broadley's Museum in Bihar have been relocated to the collections of the Indian Museum in Kolkata. His country seat in Bradpole has been subdivided the Knapp is now St. James Nursing Home, and its former gatehouse is a separate residence. A phonograph recording of Broadley delivering a toast in 1888 to Edmund Yates and Arthur Sullivan survives. Works English Legislation for India, 1871 Ruins of the Nalanda Monasteries at Burgayon, Subdivision Bihar, Zilla Patna Calcutta, Bengal Secretariat Press 1872. The Last Punic War. Tunis, past and present, with a narrative of the French conquest of the Regency. W. Blackwood and Sons. 1882. Le General Boulanger. A Duquesne. 1887. Dr. Johnson and Mrs. Thrale, including Mrs. Thrale's unpublished journal of the Welsh Tour Maid in 1774, and much hitherto unpublished correspondence of the Streatham Coterie. London, John Lane the Bodley Head, 1909. How We Defended Arabi and His Friends, A Story of Egypt and the Egyptians' Second Ed. London, Chapman and Hall, 1884. Alexander Mayrick Broadley Rose, John Holland, 1908. 
Dumouriez and the Defense of England Against Napoleon. London, J. Lane. Alexander Mayrick Broadley, Harold Felix Baker Wheeler, 1908. Napoleon and the Invasion of England, The Story of the Great Terror. Napoleon in Caricature, 1795-1821. minus London, John Lane, 1911. The History of Freemasonry in the District of Malton. London, George Kenning, 1880. The Two Scribbling Mrs. P. P. S., The Intimate Letters of Hester Piazzi and Penelope Pennington, 1788-1821, minus six vols, ed. Oswald Knapp, collected and arranged by A.M. Broadley, The Knapp, 1914.